Ah, uh, yes. Glory to Raptoria. Hello again there, friends and fans. Raptor here, and welcome to a political simulator known as Suzerain, I believe. This game, of course, available now on Steam, allows you to take control of a great empire, a glorious nation. Glory to Raptoria down below in that comment section. If you've ever wanted to uh, write the backstory of a leader and then eventually be uh, elected or a coup to take control of a nation, then this is the game for you where you'll then have to possibly invade other nations, go to war, and or uh, deal with economic issues, political issues, legal issues inside your own country. This will be quite an interesting one. So anyway, without further ado, go ahead and smash that like button. And of course, subscribe if you're new here. This is going to be definitely an interesting game and will require a lot of reading. So sit back, enjoy, and allow me to take you on a ride. Let's begin. You are my enslavement and my freedom. You are my flesh, burning like a raw summer night. You are my country. Nineteen o eight, Kingdom of Swordland. You open your eyes to this world, and you came from a middle income family in the city of Holsword. Your parents named you Anton. As the only child of a diligent civil servant, you lived quite an ordinary childhood. Life was not bad. You were lucky enough to attend a well-known public school. But frequent fights broke out at the Rain family home. These made you feel uneasy. The years passed. September 9th, 1923. During a class at school, the bell started to ring unexpectedly. You heard a loud commotion outside. As everyone tried to figure out what was going on, the principal announced a historic revolution. The kingdom was no more, and the Republic of Swordland was born. You did not fully understand. 1926. After graduating, you passed the university exam with high marks. You had the opportunity to choose between several studies, and you chose law at the Whole Sword State University. During the first year, you attended a lecture with uh, David Wilski. He was a sort of well-known diplomat from a foreign ministry and the son of the president. After observing the hall in silence, he explained that how the Supreme Court is obstructing justice in Swordland. He stated that laws should be applied fairly and that even the members of the Supreme Court are subject to the same laws. You agreed in principle. May 22nd, 1927. Soldiers entered the campus in the evening ahead of the first election. Many were in shock as the uniformed men created a security cordon and started arresting the teachers. A group of students started gathering in protest. Along with your best friend, Peter Vectern, you decided to protest with the students. One of the officers made a loud announcement that echoed through the campus. General Luteran declared martial law in order to restore the administration. Please stand back and disperse to your rooms. You join the students, slowly march towards the large group of soldiers. Suddenly, the soldiers charged. A student fell and was trampled as everybody started running away. You held your ground. The soldiers beat you relentlessly. It was a gloomy year. October 10th, 1927. The arrested teachers were replaced by those promoted to uh, conformism to the, st uh, to the state. Olsword turned a blind eye to, those, to the things that were happening. You didn't want to stay idle and decided to join a human rights group. The group heavily protested against the deteriorating uh, human rights situation in Swordland. The contrib you contributed through discussions on how to protect and expand freedoms. In one of the meetings, Peter introduced you to one of his friends, Monica, who was a volunteer at the Swordish League of Women. You were immediately attracted to her diligence. The politically charged environment led you to stay away from any political organization. June 2nd, 1928. 
the radio relayed that the communist general Rickard surrounded Lutheran and his troops demanding their surrender. They refused and heavy fighting broke out across the country. You couldn't believe it. The army was fighting amongst themselves. Swordland plunged into chaos. The clashes escalated into a full-blown civil war. The horrors made you isolate yourself for a while. Monica helped you cope, and love grew between the two of you. However, it will be a difficult time for love. The chaos must end. 1929. Republic of uh, Swordland. The charismatic colonel, to Queen Sol, demonstrated a sudden coup and brought to an end the chaos. He wrote a new constitution and restored stability. The people saw him as a savior. He formed the United Swordland Party and ran the pre as a presidential candidate in the first ever elections. You voted for the United Swordland Party. June 1929. The United Swordland Party won the election by a, si a large majority. After graduation, you kept seeing Monica and noticed her interest to marry. However, a letter arrived from the military calling you to fulfill your compulsory service. It was time to serve your national duty. February 30th, Burger Region. A devastating civil war broke out in the neighboring country, Wehelen. The distinguished mayor, Yosef uh, uh, Iosef Lenka ordered you to lead your squad on a border patrol mission. It was very cold winter night when you began marching out of the Gumren outpost. You could see your breath. After several hours of marching through the snowy hills, distant noises were heard. Visibility was too low to confirm the source, and the squad crawled forward in formation and found a spot to observe. A group of refugees had made it beyond the border fence. You... escorted them back. The refugees were in despair when they realized that you were taking them back to the border. Screams and protests ensued as they were restrained. You delivered them to the border guards. After several, mini, uh, after several months of military service, your duties ended and you went back to civilian life. Nineteen thirty-one. You and Monica uh, decided to share your lives together. After receiving the blessing of her parents, a ceremony was held in Horseland, a Horsland. During the same year, you were offered a high-paying job at the governing United Swordland Party. It was important to start your career on a good foot, so you accepted it. It was the best opportunity to change the country for the better. You became the legal assistant to one of the more experienced members of the assembly. You worked long and hard, staying late and work, uh, and got, uh, at work and going through the hundreds of pages of legal documents. You were climbing the ladder. September 1933. Seoul strengthened the Republic by removing the institutions and symbols of the former, former kingdom from society. Things were also looking up for the country as the massive economic boom continued and people were the happiest they'd been in a decade. Election time came and it was decided President uh, Tarquin Seoul was elected once more. April 2nd, 1934. The ongoing legal battle between the Justice Ministry and the Supreme Court put you under a lot of stress, but your significant contribution Contribution to the legal case triggered an invitation to meet President, Tar uh, President Saul himself, who offered you a key position. You were to become the youngest member of Assembly. You accepted right away. June 1938. As the youngest MP, it was difficult to connect with the influential inner circle. You needed allies, so you brought Peter as your right-hand man. The birth of your son, Frank, provided a brief moment of joy and relief. You sacrifice family to improve your position in the party. October 1941. Along with Peter, you've done a great deal of things to cement your position in the party. Meanwhile at home, Monica and Prake felt your absence. At the same time, President Sol increased his authority over the years. His growing ego started to cause strife within the party. The cracks began to show. October 1945. President Saul 
barely secured a majority in the election against the opposition leader. Over the past year, people were growing discontent with the corruption and the worsening quality of life. Meanwhile, calls for the United Swordland Party Congress became louder as the leadership struggle started to brew. You watch from the sidelines. July 1946. The contender for the party leadership was Ewald Alfonso, a reformist and a talented business magnate uh, with a growing popularity within the party. Meanwhile, in a desperate effort to secure votes before the Congress, President Saul was meeting party members one by one. He approached you too. The President offered you the position of Ministry of Justice and Law in the next government if you backed him in the upcoming vote. I reject it. August 1946. The party congress was nothing short of impressive. The banners of United Swordland were decorating every possible spot. Thousands of influential party figures, lobbyists, and benefactors gathered for this turning point. The voting for the party leadership began. You voted for Ewald Alfonso. September 1st, 1946. The efforts bore fruit and the continuous leadership uh, vote was won by Ewald Alfonso. During the Congress, Saul announced his retirement from politics. You knew the structure he had established was to stay. The country you had become increasingly authorita authoritarian. You uh, were happy that Saul was finally leaving. October 15th, 1946. A month later, your daughter was born. Monica named her Deanna. She motivated you during tumultuous period in the party. The general elections were approaching. The United Sorland Party was under the new leadership of Ewald Alfonso. You joined the party effort and campaigned for him. 1949. Uh, during the general elections, the main opposition leader was embroiled in a scandal with his secretary, diminishing their chances. The extensive privatization program proposed by Ewald Afonso secured an election victory over the United Swordland Party. Over the next years, you did your best to make Swordland a better place. Nineteen fifty one. The presidency of Ewald Afonso saw many bold reforms but was followed by a serious economic recession. The other parties announced their bids for the 1953 election, but the unfair system hampered all opposition efforts to win. You were worried about the economic recession. Together with Peter, your presence in the USP grew, and you became the new face of uh, the new wing of the party. You effectively took over the leadership as President Alfonso lost control of the country. The moment to make a move had come. You advised Alfonso to step down. He didn't take your advice seriously and started to reshuffle his cabinet, but most of his inner circle abandoned him. Your diplomatic attitude made the party vote you in as their leader. Following this, you announced that you would be running for president in the general election with Peter as your running mate. It was your turn. October 1953. After visiting every city and town during the campaign, you made a speech on state television, and you promised to enact de de uh, democratic reforms. The people are tired of empty promises. We need fundamental change in our institutions and government. A solid and transparent democracy awaits us. Brothers and sisters, a new constitution and a new age is upon us. The broadcast ended. November 5th, 1953. On election day, millions went down to cast their votes. It was time to face the truth. Chapter 1. President Rain. We won! All right. Well, thanks for sticking with me. Now, this will definitely not be uh, everybody's type of game, but I've played a few like these, and they're quite invest. You get invested in them as you create a character through your decisions. 
Election promises. As Anton Rain, you have made many promises to the people of Swordland in order to gain their votes. They must be considered very carefully. Economy. Swordland's economy has been based on the plan doctrine since its formation until the former president, Ewald Alfonso, enacted free market reforms. Now the country finds itself between two economic systems. Let's continue to promote that free market. Diplomacy. The intensifying global rivalry between capitalists Arcasia Ar Ar in the West and the communist United Cantana in the East is opening new diplomatic possibilities. Swordland could take steps to align itself closer to one. Well, if we're going to promote a new free market, we should support or be supported by those who agree with us or do the same who could advise us. Immigration. In recent years, Bloodish, Wesek, and Ant Angnolian emigrants flocked to Swordland due to relaxed immigration laws enacted by Ewald Alfonso. As a result, tensions in, in swords and immigrants have been increasing. Keep immigration relaxed. We're going to need people for all those new jobs we're going to create. Term focus. We have also promised to focus on a certain extensive subject within our first term. The people expect us to solve the negative situations with the topic while providing an overall improvement to the related policies. Health, education, law enforcement, or military. Let's go with education. If we're going to do health, we should first prepare schools for doctors, then focus on uh, health, which then hopefully will require less people to uh, commit crimes and less police because they'll be too busy being rich as doctors. Your promises will be remembered, and they will have consequences. Are you sure about your decision? Yes. Two weeks have passed since we won the election, and now I was about to be sworn as the fourth president of Swordland. Thousands were watching as the inauguration ceremony and cheering my name, Anton Rain. The die was cast. In the distance, the Maroon Palace stood on top of... Oh, you can actually read about it. Cool. The Maroon Palace stood on top of the famous Hill of Pride. Oh, wow. That's cool. I had no way of knowing what future awaited for me there. I looked at my family and my son Frank and Deanna were next to Monica, my wife. Her eyes were glimmering with pride. Then I turned uh, towards the key people who made it all possible. Of course, each individual was promised an important position in my cabinet. Cabinet? Why would you put all these people in your cabinet? Why not, like, have them in your, you know, console? Oh. Refrigerator, maybe? As my thoughts slowly faded away, the reality of the situation dawned on me. Orso Hawker, the Justice of the Supreme Court, was waiting for me. The time for the oath has come. It has indeed. Please repeat after me. I do solemnly swear, I do solemnly swear that I will respectfully execute the office of the President of Swordland, and to the best of my ability, preserve, protect, and defend the people and constitution of the Republic of Swordland. You may now deliver your inauguration speech, Mr. President. It is an honor. Dear citizens of Swordland, the crowd looked very eager to listen to me. The idea of unity, for many generations, this country and its long history have kept us tied to an idea. The idea of unity, and our people's right for a free and po prosperous life. If we stand together, we shall prevail. In the past, there have been times of survival times of conflict and economic hardship too, but whenever we stood together, we prevailed. The future awaits us. It's time to turn our faces to the West. Change now, not in the next decade or years. Today. Hundreds of thousands cheered and they were shouting my name in unison. I felt the responsibility, the power, and the burden all at the same time. Enjoy the moment. Taking a deep breath in, I enjoyed the moment. I took a long look at the people of Swordland to, oh, to burn this moment into my memory. 
One of the presidential guards came by to notify me that it was time to leave. I made my way to the leading car of the motorcade. The presidential state car was a jet black Catalia with the flags of Swordland above the front headlights. Next to it, a man was holding the door. Sergei Wolkner. Hello, Mr. President. Still under the effect of the speech I made, hearing my new title made me smile. If you allow me to introduce myself, I am Sergei, your new driver. Nice to meet you, Sergei. It's an honor. He respectfully bowed his head before opening the car door and gesturing inside. I entered the car. We'll be heading towards the palace. The motorcade began to move. On the way, Sergei proceeded to explain his duties as a driver. As minutes passed by, I found myself lost in thoughts again, barely paying any attention to what he was saying, and suddenly made a gesture towards a now closer palace. Isn't it a beauty? The Maroon Palace. It was He was right. Sunlight glinted off the palace's many maroon-colored domes. It was so bright that I had to look away. Every time I look at it, I am reminded of my duty to this nation. So do I, Sergei. It's beating heart. It is the beating heart of this nation, after all. Well said, Mr. President. The car drove past the majestic gates, continued uphill to the entrance, and stopped in front of the doors. Sergei got out of the car and opened the door for me. Have a great day, Mr. President. Uh, a Morga West Corps. He referred to the famous swordish phrase from the times of a revolution, Amorga Westcor, Vector and Sisda, which means morning will come, victory is close. Uh, see you soon. I made my way upstairs through the extravagant corridors of the palace, marble and engraved wooden finishes decorated the interior. My footsteps echoed in the colossal halls. The guards bowed their heads in respect as I opened the massive doors to my new office. We're here, baby. We made it. Woo. All right. Chapter one. All right, that's us in the lower left corner. Let's look around a little bit. So this is our nation here. And there's all these nations around us. So we have Lauren, Bruni, uh, Lesbia, Pergia, Gels Gelsland, uh, Nargis, and let's see what's in the north. Angeland, and then a huge area up here. This must be like the, the Soviet Union. Uh, Rum Rumberg, Angolia, and then Val, Val Gelsland. Interesting. So these must be the capitals of all the other nations. Oh, there's their flags, too. Congratulations from President Alvarez. Congratulations from President Smolak. So they have presidents here. These might actually be uh, in our control, too. I'm not exactly sure. Oh, these these must be different districts within our uh, our kingdom, perhaps. Maybe. I'm not sure exactly. Or these might be nations that we could eventually take over. If there's cities here, we might be able to interact with them eventually. Possibly launch military invasions. Rumberg. They don't say anything to us. Congratulations from the Prime Minister Van Hort Hooten. Congratulations from Chancellor Hegel. Interesting. You can even see the logos of some of these nations. This one seems to be some flowers. This one is an anchor. This one is a ship. Interesting. That one being a cross. Okay. Lots to read, of course. If you'd like to read that, go ahead and pause at any time. There seems to be documents around, too, but they're in a different language. So this game is really like, uh, you know, Hearts of Iron, except you're a leader where everything is about really reading through things and feeling the situation rather than just pointing and making a decision. So if you really want to play a fictional political game, this is definitely it. Country overview. So you can see all of our policies now. Limited women's rights. There's a huge backlog in the court system. There's economics issues. 
military, welfare, order, and diplomacy. Do we have to work to resolve a lot of these issues? Here's our cabinet, I believe. Uh, vice president, uh, chief strategist, minister of security of defense, all sorts of different people, minister of, minister of law, old guard, oil guards and refor reformists. We have seats too? Wow, damn, this is cool. Right now our party controls 130 seats. There's the PFJP and the NFP and 10 independents. Gloria Tory, Speaker of the Grand National Assembly, and then Leaders of the Assembly, Independent Leader, NFP, and the PFJP. We'll have to learn about those. Judiciary, Old Guards, five, Centrist, three, Reformist, three. Wow. Budget, Wealth, and Economy status. And notes. Feel free to take notes to help you remember important parts of the story. Wow, cool. That's really neat. Oh, we have an exclamation point here. Now that we're settled in, let's see what we can do. Read the report. Logistical issues. Military general staff, I believe. Ah, here we have something of the briefing of the political situation. Uh, Peter arrived a couple of minutes early and, and sat across from me. He was struggling to hold back his smile. We did it, Anton. We won. Finally, all those years with our noses to the grindstone paid off. Peter's eyes sparkled. The strain of the past months had put a damper on his usual uh, rackish charm. But today he was looking and acting more like his old self. He loosened his tie and undid the top two buttons of his shirt. Whoa, bro. Whoa. I'm married, bro. Enjoying these new secretary I picked out for you? I thought she'd appreciate the gorgeous set of talents. It's a shame the rest of your staff aren't as easy on the eyes. He gestured to the slight paunch that protruded over... Oh, come on, bro. <laughs> uh, but hey, back in the university, did you ever imagine we would be sitting here in the Maroon Palace? We have to celebrate this great victory. Uh, let's see... Uh, we will celebrate at the inauguration ball. Just hang in there until the evening. Looking forward to it. Evelyn hopes to congratulate you in person there. Uh, let's see. I'm sure the kids will love to see Uncle Peter for the first time as the vice president. That's great to hear. It's crazy how fast those two have grown up. You're a good father. Peter had a wistful look in his eyes. He and Evelyn had never been able to have kids of their own. During our campaign, the opposition had floated the rumor that he'd fathered illegitimate children during his wilder years, but had never been substan substantiated. A door swung open, and uh, Lucien Calgalade, my chief strategist, walked in. He was a compact man with sharp bird-like features. After briefly surveying the room from wall to wall, he sat down and poured a glass of water and opened his briefcase in a series of quick, graceful mo uh, mo movements. Gentlemen... A tall case clock in the room struck three o'clock. Damn, you're exactly on time. Hello, Peter. Uh, Lucian tur turned towards me, slightly bowed his head. How are you? I am ready and able, sir. A Lu Lucian spoke in a soft, clipped tones that immediately drew your attention towards what he had to say. Peter and I waited for him to proceed. We will start the meeting by evaluating the current situation. The majority of Swordish people demand change. They are more concerned about the economy than the Constitution, but they blame the system for their problems. People are losing their trust in democracy. The frustration even causes some uh, to reason with figures like Bernard Circus. It is expected that we will bring the change the last government did not. Friends Richter, a leader of the reformists, believes that the true change can only be done by transferring some of our powers to the assembly. It'll move into details of their demand shortly. Uh, we need to listen to the people. If we lose powers to the government, we won't be able to execute changes. Let's listen to the people. That's exactly what we campaign for, a true change for the country to move forward. We will need many allies against the old guards and the government. 
Mr. Richter managed to influ influence many members of the assembly to give their support for drafting a new constitution. Reformist politicians are quickly increasing in number. While the reformist wing inside our party is still a minority, they could have a tripartisan majority in the assembly, especially if they unite with Friends Richter. Mr. Richter could be a powerful ally and our goal to maintain majority in the assembly. Yes. He definitely, he's definitely a key in this. Reformist demands are clear. They want to limit the president's veto powers and ensure that the Supreme Court is independent and taking away their right to vote on constitutional amendments. Hmm. We need a proper balance of power. We must listen to their demands. Otherwise, we're no different. I won't allow them to influence me. Uh, let's go with the first one. I will support the reformists. We need a proper balance of power. I agree. It's better not to go against the wind of change that is ranging around the country at this moment. The old guards will do their best to preserve the Constitution. Chief Justice Hawker, uh, as allied judges, have a great influence over the Supreme Court, uh, which will be tough to break. The court also has an abrupt power over the constitutional uh, legislation. Without their approval, we cannot even change it. Uh, we need a comprehensive bill to power the structure more fairly. I agree. The old guard won't like this, though. Comprehensive reform that would make the reformists happy would mean maintaining a balance between all branches of the government, which means removing your absolute veto as well. Reformists demand loopholes in the Constitution to be fixed. We cannot underestimate the situation. We will figure it out. Our party still holds 130 out of 250 seats in the Assembly. That is power. However, to reform the Constitution, we must achieve a two-thirds majority in the Grand National Assembly, which is 166 votes, and a simple majority in the Supreme Court that equates to six votes. After we've settled our thoughts on how to proceed, we need to talk with our party figures. Our goal must be to get the 150 signature to start the process. Following the green light from the USP, we will reach out to the other party leaders to see if the court, uh, if they will back our draft, and the last step is to convince the justices of the court. The entire process will take a long time, but we must start working to reform a committee, a committee to evaluate all possibilities for a constitution as soon as possible. We will write a more depth. Uh, let's see. We'll work with the old guard to protect the existing powers. Uh, first one. We will write a more democratic constitution with the reformists. That's what we've been preparing internally. People elected us because of our promise of the democratic reforms. Uh, the key thing here will be strengthening the power of the assembly, which we already lead with majority. Peter nods in agreement. Yes, the divisions of power need to be rebalanced for a better swordland. According to the internal draft we made with the reformists, there are two changes to the Constitution that are not open for their discussion. First, the Supreme Court will no longer vote on constitutional amendments. Second, the President's absolute veto will be taken away. This can be replaced with a limited veto system fixing the current loopholes. I have no problems with these clauses. Let's work with the reformists. Yes, sir. Uh, we will form a committee together with the whole parties, start reaching out to all the stakeholders in the Assembly Court for a new constitution. More information about the request of parties and reform contents will be available later this year. Another important point is that we must be aware about the Lotharberg Group and the oil archies convene under this group to influence economic policies. Oh, lobbyists. Okay. According to the reports, some members of the National Business Council are in their pockets. They will surely try to bribe us for special economic interests. I won't be bought. It won't happen. As far as I know, Simon Hall has some ties to this group and we may try using his influence if we deem it necessary. And we'll use that to our advantage. They will only side with us if they see an advantage. Of course, unless, of course, if there's only money involved. We need to tread carefully on all sides when power, with all power players in order to survive our term. Well then, gentlemen, precisely 30 minutes. This concludes our political briefing for today. Our next meeting will be about the media strategy. Talk to you soon. Sir, I will keep in touch. See you next meeting.
Lucian, Anton. Uh, Lucian and Peter bid their farewells and leave. Wow. Damn, this is going to be a beefy game, dude. I like this. It's a hell of a lot of stuff to read, which might be boring to people, but this is politics, bro. It's not like, you know, click and thing happen. You know, you got to read and know all the power players, and, you know, the government doesn't have all the power, all the uh, big businesses and money inside the... Money and guns, baby. That's what has the power. Money and guns. And Jeff Bezos. All right, guys. Well, that's going to be it for our first episode here at this game. If you want to see more, make sure you smash that like button and subscribe. And uh, I know this game isn't for everybody, but if you made it to the end of the video, I hope you really enjoyed this. I hope you check it out, and I hope you have a fantastic day. A round of applause to you for being here, and I hope to see everybody very, very soon. Take care. We'll see you next time, and glory to Raptoria. Goodbye, everybody.